You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. So welcome to um, Parkley Prison in Sydney. Um, my name is Paul Baker, I'm the Governor of Parkley. I've been here since April 2019 when we first took over the contract. It's a private sector operation, part of the uh, Corrective Services New South Wales network uh, of 25 to 30 prisons across the whole of New South Wales. Currently looking after between 13,000 and 14,000 prisoners across the state. Park Clare's an operating capacity of 1,350. I'll ask the people either side of me just to introduce themselves and then we'll start by just talking about the issues that we faced, and I faced in particular in the early days of the contract, trying to establish a rehabilitative culture at Parkley. So I'll start with my Deputy Governor first. Hello, I'm Sarah Mallander. I'm the Deputy Governor at Parkley, and I've been here since June 2020. And my name is Ferry Lee. I'm a senior psychologist, uh, as well as looking after the programs for Parkley Correctional Centre. Um, so Sarah, uh, we'll start with you. Just talk a bit about um, your previous UK experience, first of all? So I um, have got a range of experience in a number of different settings, both not-for-profit, private sector and public sector. And I've worked in and around corrections for a a good number of years, at least 20 odd. Um, For me, it's all about really what do we do to help um, inmates here specifically to move on in their lives. and to make a successful integration back into their communities or indeed move um, seamlessly on to the next jail um, that they would go to after partly. Um, And can I just ask uh, as well, what were the first things you noticed when you arrived at Partly? So when did you come to Partly? Um, I joined the Partly team in June 2020. I think um, some of the first things were, um, interestingly, the palm trees, um, as well as the parrots and other flora and fauna in in the site. Um, And just a different way of doing things in the way of um, things such as more of a, a... a military style, I guess, of how to manage the, the prisons. So certainly other things um, that are available to us here compared to the UK are things such as gas and also weapons in terms of um, control, I guess, around um, situations involving inmates and a different culture. So um, what we're very, very big on here is um, reducing reoffending and also we've got um, something called Bionic, which is, believe it or not, I care, uh, which is embedded in um, the MTC philosophy over in the States, which we've adopted over here, which is around for us, believe it or not, I care, in safety, security and decency within the custodial setting. So this is something that's quite unique to Park Lee, and I'm sure whilst the, the state prisons and other prisons have a similar take, this is something that, that we believe in. And we also have the Park Lee way, uh, which is a number of factors which staff and also to a degree inmates sign up to as well about having a sense of pride within the within the centre that we manage and doing the best for each other as colleagues but also the best for uh, for our inmates as well. Um, so that's something that we've worked um, hard to embed in, uh, in the partly culture um, since I started here. I think as well what I find here is that the staff and I felt this on day one the staff have a real enormous pride in um, showcasing what they do and showcasing what we do as a centre. And every single visitor that I've brought in has actually commented on the enthusiasm, the pride and the passion that members of staff have when a visitor goes up and, and actually sees what we deliver on the ground. And equally, inmates have said to me themselves that it's a very different environment they get treated as a, as a human being, they get treated as a person, and that staff genuinely care. And I, t- I have a huge sense of pride when I hear that both from visitors and inmates as well. So there's a lot in what you said. Um, going right back to the beginning, you said there's sort of a semi-militaristic model. So what do you mean by that? In the way of um, a parade at 8am every morning, uh, which is a good opportunity actually for staff to get together. It's a, it's a roll call for staff and to make sure that we pass on important messages for each day. Um, so if it's a, we've, we've had to deal with a number of issues around COVID, so it could be around COVID, it could be a reminder of something, a, a visitor that's coming in or a specific message that we want to get across. 
Well, the, the parade is, is exactly as you're saying, Paul, really, but it is an opportunity for staff to come together, but a parade isn't known in, in a UK centre. Um, so that there's there's that really, I think that's the main main difference that I noticed when I came here. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I would reflect on the, um, the, the uniformed, the uniform of the state and the um, but all grades up to and including um, the governor, everyone wears a uniform. Mm. Uh, and above that, at more senior levels of the service, and that struck me as um, being very, very different to what you would see in the UK. And a bit of me have always wondered about um, an approach in which you're trying to say that prisons are places where change is possible. They can be therapeutic environments in which we can bring out the best in people. Yeah. If the model is that um, uh, there is a uh, militaristic sense of dress, I wonder, uh, I don't know the answer to this, I wonder if um, that would impact upon an inmate's perception of what it is that they're here for and is it simply containment in a um, very restrictive way uh, or is it a place in which we hope to engage inmates to think about what their future might look like? Mm. And one thing to highlight is that the corrective services uniform actually mimics that of the New South Wales Police. So it's a very similar colour scheme, ranking structure. So um, that's what inmates see when they uh, when, when people are in the community, they see the police. But then when they come to uh, the corrective services prison, they also see that same colour scheme. Yeah, and, and so Ferry, you've worked, um, I think, in a state jail, uh, mm -hmm. and you've worked at this jail. Would, would you say there are some marked differences from what you found here to what you found working in your previous? Yeah, I think I think the attitude. So uh, culturally, um, what we try to project here at, at Parkley is very different to what I've seen in the state jails. Um, the state jails uh, have a very uh, one-minded culture. Um, I remember a, a quote uh, that I heard. Um, I don't remember where I heard from, but someone said that um, correctional officers were the biggest gang in the state. So if you think about gang affiliations, um, a correctional officer said we're the biggest gang in the state. Um, so when you have that mentality, um, it changes your interaction, your perception, and how you work with um, uh, prisons and inmates. Uh, whereas here, I think that the biggest difference and the biggest um, uh, difference in, in idea and in, in how we treat people. Number one, decency and respect is a really important thing um, and something that really caught my attention before I started here was that Paul mentioned that when you work with inmates and work with people, if you treat them like a dog, they're going to act like a dog. So I think if you can change that perception and change the idea of how you work with people, because I think most people have a perception with people in incarcerated in custody that they will act in a particular way. But if you also treat them in that way, they'll continue to act that way. So you've got to think about how you treat them, um, you know, using the, the philosophy of decency and respect. And also, as, as Sarah mentioned, with Bionic, believe it or not, I care. When you follow through with something, or when you give an instruction, or when you provide an action, um, you have to have that sense of care about it as well. And that changes how you treat the inmate as well. The other thing I think, I think it's broadly similar, and I welcome both of your views on this, is just the experience of the media and uh, the negative perception of inmates, um, prisoners, prisons, uh, and the criticism that uh, we may receive. And uh, to most, I found that broadly similar to what we might have experienced um, in the UK. Generally, prisons are seen as places that um, people want to see people locked up, they want to see them punished, um, they want them to learn their lesson, they want them to not come back. So we need to be you know, tough uh, and so on, which I don't have a particular issue with, but I wondered, um, probably Sarah, your experience or what you think about media coverage and portrayal of what it is that we're trying to do here and how that may act as a particular challenge at Parkley. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's very similar. However, I think there is the extra media spotlight on ourselves plus other private providers within the country. I, I think it would be probably similar to other jurisdictions in other countries as well. Because we're private, we do have that extra spotlight, that extra focus. Um, so you might have a similar incident happen in a different um, prison that's state-run, 
um, and that wouldn't necessarily get any media attention or focus or, or anything else. So just this week, for example, a, a death in custody in another centre, a privately run centre, attracted media attention um, on a Facebook group as well. And whereas if that was to happen anywhere else, they wouldn't even probably get a mention. And I find that difficult, really, um, particularly for staff involved. Um, so staff feel they have to go that extra mile to almost prove a point that we're just as good and we do the same role as, as other colleagues working in the state, whereas actually everyone's got an equally important role to play. Whether you're state, whether you're privately run, it actually doesn't matter. It's about what you actually do in the centre and then how you work as a network with colleagues in other centres to actually make the difference. Yeah, I think the thing that struck me was the, the use of language, and certainly in the UK, um, 20 years ago, we debated uh, the topic of, you know, what do we even refer to prisoners as? Uh, and we, um, there's been lots of debate, and I think sometimes it's a bit of a sideshow. Um, but here in Australia, they're referred to as inmates. In New South Wales, that's fine. Um, but the, the general language of um, talking about crims and crooks surprises me uh, and I'm not saying that's just within corrective services but more generally in the wider community is something that has um, has struck me so I wonder if you've got a particular view about media portrayal use of language and actually is language that important? Absolutely I think um, it goes back to an us and them kind of mentality so if you use us as the staff the officers um, the, the key holders and then talk about the inmates or the prisoners um, as the crims and the crooks, it has that separation. Um, and you can get a lost in that. Again, if you don't have that um, uh, approach of, of providing care, safety, decency, um, if you don't have that approach, then you can easily have that separation and say, well, I'm in, on this side of the line and you're on that side of the line. And I think that is probably a bit more glamorised in television, in the media, um, certainly on, on television shows about um, you know, prisons and, and you know, custodial settings. Um, and again, it's, it's probably more glamorized. I think what I, what I want to say about that is that the layperson doesn't understand what it takes um, end to end from when a, a person comes into custody and then leaves custody. I don't think they understand what it takes to house them, manage them, to provide them with decency and security, safety. Um, so when you know we talk about how much it costs to run a jail, the right person will look at that number and go, that's too much, we should be spending that in other particular areas that they might want to support, uh, want support in. Um, but we know how important it is to be able to, to manage that, that person safely and securely. Um, it costs a lot of money, but I don't think the lay person recognises that there's a huge investment. It's not just money, it's the, the, the manpower involved, it's the ability to run programs and education, it's the ability to um, have the, the inmates working um, so they feel like they're contributing to society. And then also that, that secondary thing, which is treating them in a, in a particular way with decency respects, so that hopefully they can carry that on when they do um, eventually leave as well. Yeah, so there are some very, um, some great similarities. Uh, I think you're right um, in what we see in the UK about the perception of crime, prisoners, what prisoners are here to do. And the Labour one is interesting. Um, a, a good friend of mine now being passed in the UK, Ruth Mann used to say, why do we call offenders by the very thing we want them not to be? So if we refer to them as crims, refer to them as offenders, uh, that's a label that potentially they will live up to. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so I'm pretty strong on that, I think. And certainly here we discourage use of um, any term like crims and crooks and so on. Um, but equally, I won't go down the line of saying uh, prisoners who are locked up are service users. I think there was a clear role for prisons to containly, securely uh, and humanely contain prisoners in a secure environment. That is our number one priority for me, which is you must protect the public, is your first priority as a governor. And then to your point, Ferry, while you're here, you should be held safely and securely, and that there should be systems within your establishment that can enable you um, to facilitate the environment in which Prisoners, when they leave, are just less likely to come back because the cost of reoffending is just eyeball tree. And if you can start to reduce reoffending by three, four, five, six percent, that that is that that's thousands of fewer victims every single year um, that 
that the community might experience, and that has to be um, our number one priority. Um, I, I wonder, the other thing I have noticed, and I'll ask your views on this, is actually are inmates ready for an environment in which we are trying to rehabilitate, and whether they see themselves actually as crimson crooks and this is the life they've chosen. And I wonder if either of you have got any reflection on that. I think it depends on the inmate. And I think within every inmate's journey, there becomes a point when they decide for themselves that actually now is the time to change. So I had a, we had a, a, a delegate committee, which is a committee consisting of inmate delegates from within the centre, because one thing that we're busy developing here is a, a refreshed strategy around how we um, keep um, Aboriginal um, inmates within the centre and in a safe and secure way. So we're looking at an Aboriginal inmate strategy here. And we had a delegate committee um, last week where one of the Aboriginal delegates had said he'd been in prison, he was former Stolen Generation, and spoke a little bit about his upbringing and his childhood, and then said he'd been in and out of prison for the last 20, 30 years. And he realised being at Partly, actually, this is the time to change. And he was keen to pioneer and champion an initiative to... Um, support other inmates in and around the centre to also look at points of change in their life. And so and I, I do believe that it might not be here at Partly right now, it might be in another centre further down the line in the sentence, or if they happen to come back to Partly, but there will be a trigger for everyone where they say, enough's enough, I've got, I've got to either get clean this time or stop doing what I'm doing or stop the repeated patterns of behaviour. It might not be for everyone, um, but I do think I've seen that in a majority of cases here. And I think when we have an inmate who puts their hand up to say, I want to stop and I would like some help to stop, then I think it's right that we put those strategies in place to help with that decision. But Ferry, have you got a view about that? how we make view themselves and whether they feel they're locked into this self-fulfilling prophecy in which this is their life and this is all they can expect and whether it's a real challenge to get them to think they can do something different with their lives? Um, I think the words you use, self-filling prophecy, are really important because it's not just about um, the self-filling prophecy of them, um, you know, living a life of crime, continuing to, to re-offend, but it's actually within the jail as well, within, within the, the correctional centre. They've got this perception uh, that they need to be strong. And the idea of being strong in a correctional centre, in a, in, a, in a prison, is to challenge when you're being challenged, is to puff your chest up is not ask for help, is to argue for, you, for, for what you want, um, to, to even get to the point of fighting to, to get what you want. So I think that's that sort of feeling prophecy. There's already that perception that that's how, what, what strong looks like within a jail. Um, what we need to try and do is work towards what does strong also look like? Is it asking for help? Is it being able to um, educate yourself on, on how to, to, to um, uh, you know, education on anything really, you know, developing um, life skills, um, you know, getting an education in construction, first day, whatever it might be. So we've got, we've got to change that definition of strong because strong looks very different in a prison sense. Um, and if we can change that, again, by, by reinforcing uh, the idea of decency, uh, safety, security, um, by um, engaging with them in a pro-social way. So again, a lot of the staff, including the officers in particular, if they can engage with, with uh, the inmates in a very appropriate pro-social way and set that example and model that behaviour, then that can go a long way to getting them to understand that they don't have to sit in that prototype of what jail strong looks like. It could be something completely really different. Yeah. yeah, I think they're good points. Um, the, the other issue, and you mentioned it, Sarah, was... Um, First Nations people, uh, Aboriginal inmates uh, and their experience in custody. Um, I suppose the newest um, analogy to the UK is uh, the black and minority ethnic population within prisons. Uh, and we know that at every stage of the criminal justice system in the UK, there being a population where they're represented, so more likely to leave school early, more likely to be stopped and searched, more likely to be arrested, charged, sentenced, sentenced to longer, uh, and then while in custody, more likely to be disproportionately represented in terms of prison offences and so on. Um, so I wondered if you've got any reflections on this particular issue, because I think you're right. I think if there's one thing I don't think we've done well enough and I want to do better, is how we support Aboriginal inmates while in custody and give them every opportunity to not re-offend when they come back. Mm. 
Yeah, exactly that. And I think this is where the, the strategy that we're, we're developing will, will really assist with that. And I think equally it's important that we get inmate buy-in to that strategy as well. So just us sitting around and thinking what might work for us as managers or colleagues within the prison might not work at all for, uh, for the inmates. So uh, I think the working party that we're setting up will be incredibly helpful for that. Um, because it's how um, inmates support other inmates from a peer perspective as well, which is, because obviously you can't have all of the inmates on a, a working party, but it's making sure that there's voice and there's representation from each of the residential areas to come together to look at what strategy would work. And the first discussions we had last week were around different programmes, as well as other activities, so art, um, creative activities, um, various other things as well, even down to, to beads um, and items of cultural significance as well. And it was a, a really good, um, quite a passionate meeting really, with the inmates being expressing very clearly what they felt would work in a custodial setting, but also providing that peer support, which is incredibly useful. Um, we have a, an excellent um, Aboriginal case planner here who the inmates respect. Um, he's a paid employee, but there's only one of him. We've got to look at how we widen that support in order to provide the, the level of, of support, interaction and engagement that the inmates need here. And, and Ferry, you're obviously um, you know, an Australian uh, and lived in Australia. I don't, I don't look at where I am. Uh, and I never judge people by it with appearances. And um, the, the, the issue uh, of the average, Aboriginal population, I take it, is a long-standing one. And I wondered what you thought of the particular challenges we might face in trying to engage that population. I think, speaking for myself, it's a lack of understanding. So it's not um, to be ignorant, and it's not to, to not be interested, but it's just a lack of understanding. So finding opportunities to actually engage with someone who understands the culture, uh, the Indigenous culture, um, and ask them questions uh, sometimes you need to look a, bit, look a bit silly to be able to learn something, but my approach is always to ask questions about how, what's the best way to engage with that particular culture, what are some of the cultural sensitivities that I need to be mindful of, um, and I think with this, the Aboriginal specialist that we do have on, on staff, he's going to go a long way because we can ask those questions, we can ask about how do we provide the support that, that the Aboriginal uh, cohort needs, um, and, and how do we do that in a respectful way. So I think, if anything, for, for speaking for myself, it's more, it's not so much ignorance, it's just not knowing, but we have people that we can ask questions to and we need to do more of that. And we also need the staff to be mindful of, of their deficiencies in that area because I don't think everyone will own up to saying they don't know enough about the, the Indigenous culture. Uh, I know I'm definitely one of them. Um, I need to know more about it, so I'll go out and ask those people because they're the experts in that area and hopefully they can influence the rest of our staff in understanding that culture so that we can provide, again, programs um, and support and services to, to our Indigenous uh, cohort. I think it, you're right. I mean, the, I had a very, very steep learning curve uh, when I first arrived around um, the issue of the Aboriginal population of inmates um, and trying to get my head around and understand this wasn't the same as the BME issue in um, the UK. Uh, it's similar, but there are some real cultural differences that you've unpacked very well there. I think in, in relation to that, if I think back to the first few months here, uh, and Sarah, you mentioned Bionic, so the MTC brand, all the jazz in the States uh, and elsewhere, use Believe It Not I Care. Uh, and I remember the, certain the challenging conversations I had about trying to use the word care in the context of corrections in New South Wales was it was incredibly difficult. It was very, very difficult to use the word care, um, just in the way in which we might securely contain uh, and manage inmates. And I think the big thing that we did do well here was really try and say bionic doesn't mean care. It's not soft and cuddly. It's not fluffy. Care, I use in the sense of, um, believe it or not, I care about the thousands of victims that each of these men here may cause during their lifetime of criminality. I care about the fact that um, many of their families will serve a sentence alongside them. I care about the fact actually their children are much more likely to come back um, to prison. So the first thing was really saying we need to really care about what we do. And then when we put um, Bionic in the middle of a triangle, which we said 
we care about safety, we care about decency, we care about security. And I think we were really able to drive that message. And I think the important thing from that message is, of course, those three things are fundamentally interlinked. Mm. And that is what has made this prison infinitely safer than it was in the first six months of takeover. So I wonder, um, probably Sarah, if you've got any reflections on th the, how we try to embed um, that concept and think about how security uh, and decency and safety are linked. Yeah, absolutely. And it's how those messages are played, I think, across the centre. So um, I know one thing, Paul, that you did was look at the partly way because we needed to make sure, again, it goes a little bit back to, to programmes and developing initiatives for inmates. I think it's, it's easy at an SMT level to sit and have a discussion about a strategy or the direction that you want the centre to go in. However, unless you've got buy-in from staff, it would be impossible to achieve. So looking at the partly way and also looking at the strategy that we have where we've got different pillars around things such as um, safety, decency, security, which is each of those pillars is led by a, a member of SMT. And the thing is as well, they, they very much um, lean on each other. So you can't have a safe prison from a head of security perspective without them working with the head of residence to make sure that we've got a safe living environment. So you can have that interaction at SMT level, but it also needs to happen then at the other tiers within the centre so that everybody works together to create that one environment and that one approach to safety, um, decency and security within this setting. And, and so, Femi, I suppose the, the challenge for staff is, I'm trying to say, if you act in a decent and respectful way to inmates, there are positive benefits in terms of your personal safety and also security. And for staff, that can be a bit of a challenge if they believe the safe way of managing inmates is containment and they're locked behind their door. Yeah, but I think, you know, you said the word care, which is a really important word, and it's not about lovey-dovey, let's all hold hands and hug. It's really about, um, again, going back to that perception. So for me, we, we all work in corrections, we all work in, in, in um, correctional centres, and uh, we probably all have really gruesome, horrific stories, things that we've heard about what uh, inmates have done to other people. And um, I remember one particular situation, an officer referred to an inmate as a grub, and I said to him, well, why is a grub? What got him to that point that made him act in that way? And I think that's, again, if you change that perception, rather than saying he's a grub, he's not, he's, he's a crib, being able to take a step back and go, well, what made him the person that he is now? What, what happened in his life or what was missing from his life that allowed him to do that horrific thing? And I think that's, I don't know if it's a product of, of the work I'm in as a psychologist, but I think if you can approach um, our cohort and, and the people we work with with a bit of empathy, we're going to then start to take a step back and go, okay, well, if this was missing, how do we then support that person? How do we put that back into their life? So that when they do go out, when, when they're released in the community, because they will at some point, um, do they have the skills to be able to manage that and to um, you know, fill that deficiency um, and get the support that they might need? So I suppose it's worth reflecting on, you know, Parkley as a prison can take 1,350 inmates. Um, we do have a small minimum security side where we have up to 130 inmates. In the main side, um, you know, we'll have over 1,100 maximum security inmates, but 80% of them are remand. Uh, and yet, we know NTC is a organisation uh, that really prides itself on changing lives through the delivery of a number of different programmes. Uh, and I think that's another big challenge here is uh, the average length of stay here is often as low as 42 days, has been 35 days. And how do we deliver programmes in that context? exceptionally difficult. And more importantly for me though is then what can we do on a daily basis to foster and support desistance? So I think my personal view is not enough is spoken about the concept of desistance in which the vast majority of inmates, the vast majority of men and women in prison will in effect grow out of, mature out of criminal activity and behaviour. And that is evidenced by the age curve, which shows a significant dropping off of offending and reoffending, certainly post 30. Uh, and for me, I've always been driven by thinking, how can I pull that point forward? Instead of someone getting to 32, 33, 35 and thinking, 
this has been a pointless experience being involved in criminal activity. How can I pull that forward so that we start to say when they're 25 or 20, actually, I don't want a life like this. And I wonder, probably for you first, Harry, have you got any thoughts about how we can do that? Because that's really been my mission and aim ever since I've been within a custodial environment. How do I offer a sense of hope and purpose to men and women who feel their life has no sense, has no hope, and has no purpose? I think that's the billion dollar question, isn't it? Um, but maybe the starting point is finding out what motivates them. Um, as a psychologist, motivation is a big thing. It gets you towards your end goal. So for a person that comes to jail and continues to re-offend, um, they're motivated by something. They end up in jail, but they're motivated by something and, and that's what leads them to jail. So if we can find out what the motivation is to want them to be out, and for a lot of them it's family, it's you know, having young children, um, it's you know parents uh, you know, disappointing them. Um, it might even be you know, having the motivation to run a successful business at some point. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the person, but we've got a story of a, a person who spent time in jail, but then got out and started working with the Indigenous community and found his calling there. So again, if we can find that motivation, um, hopefully we can start steering them towards um, uh, things that they can do to keep on track with that particular motivation. But again, the motivation has got to be pro-social rather than you know, getting a quick score or, or committing a crime to, to, to get something bigger. Um, that motivation has got to be pro-social as well. So we've got to encourage that in some way. And Sarah, your background is you know, has been the head of reducing reoffending, and I wondered what your view is. What the balance is between offering programs and support assistance? Is it a fifty-fifty split? Is it predominantly around how you offer hope and sense of purpose, or is it that you can simply target people with a program if they fit into a certain category that will produce the outcome that you expect and want? Yeah, I think it would be around about a 50-50 split. And I think it's also, and, and Ferry touched on it earlier, about pro-social modelling from staff in between times. And also making sure that we think that everyone here is capable of change. Mm. And it might not be change right now, it might be change further down the line. But I'm a big believer in that people can change. And if people don't want to change, then of course, then you end up with the, the cycle and then you, you look at the, the inmates coming back in. I'm now, I've been here now almost two years and you do see the same faces come back in and sometimes they're actually quite pleased to see you, which always gives me cause for concern. Why are you happy to be back? And they say, well, I, I get treated with respect here and I also get routine. So they know that a meal is at a certain time, that this happens at a certain time and this happens at a certain time, which... If you've got a chaotic lifestyle in the community, to come back here and have that sense of routine and, and talking to, to some of the inmates about what they actually found helpful around a custodial setting is a place to detox, a place to get clean, whereas they, they know they haven't got a hope in, in the community of doing that. So they come here and set themselves a goal of then getting clean. But I think really looking at preventative measures as well, it's, it's what do you do prior to someone coming into prison to then stop them. So community interventions um, is also something I think that's incredibly helpful and any peer support that you can provide because they might not listen to us. Um, as an inmate said to me last week, I'm, well, I'll go back to my million dollar house and I'll be all right for the night. <laughs> so why, why would they listen to me when I haven't got the lived experience, but they will listen to others. So it's as much support that you can provide in that uh, pro-social sense to, to look at people's and whether or not you can influence the change in, in that way. It's interesting because actually as you're speaking, you, you sound more as if you're in support of a model that supports the system. Yeah. So I'm not really a big fan of a very formulaic approach to um, trying to reduce the offending. Uh, that the sole focus should be on targeting people who are at high risk of offending. We know that evidence says the risk need responsivity principle will say they are more likely to be positively affected by the program, which I get, and I, I wouldn't argue uh, with that at all. I think that's entirely right. But for me, the most important thing is the context. Yeah that that program is delivered. And so in the UK, uh, there was uh, an audit that took place, not just of your ability to deliver your programs, but they audited the staff's view of programs because there will be nothing more dispiriting or negative for an inmate if you go to do a program, you feel you're doing really well, you're getting positive feedback, and an officer just says, yeah, you'll keep coming back. You're just a crim. And that, I think, 
uh, is uh, sort of the key to unlock much of this. Mm. Recruiting many staff who believe, and I think you said very, change is possible, because change is. And 99% of all of these fellas there, you know, will stop offending at some point. So it comes back to how do you engage them earlier to say you need to do that program, mm. and then you get them on the program. And I wonder, you know, where, as psychologists, we're guided by this whole risk need responsibility within correctional services and within reducing reoffending, but maybe that fourth overarching thing is the environment, yeah. rather than just looking at those three things and thinking that's going to be the the the, the golden arrow. Yeah. Um, it's looking at the environment and making sure the environment is set up so that you can do those things. Yeah. I, th I think that's I think it's exactly right. So I'm going to think now then about you know we've been here three years. Um, it has been an exceptionally challenging three years, I have to say. Uh, not least of which, and I may get Sarah to talk a bit about management of COVID since we've been here. That has stifled our ability to roll out some of the innovations that we hope to deliver in our bid. Um, but if I think about some of the areas where I've taken greatest pride in doing something fundamentally different. I think the first thing I'd probably highlight is the, the drug recovery wing that we create an environment in which uh, inmates on remand can live as a community, receive uh, offending behaviour programmes, uh, be given lots of activity to keep them engaged and spend three months going through a process which for the first time for many, they're living in an environment which encourages them to be um, drug free and it was very difficult at first, and it was difficult because the staff saw a negative um, mandatory drug test uh, or a targeted test as failure. Whereas we know with um, re recovery from addiction is a journey. Uh, and um, fortunately for us, we have used Gethin Jones um, from the UK to be able to um, support both the staff and the prisoners as they go through this journey. And Gethin will say, you know, he had 14 detoxes. So that makes people think, actually, this is a journey. And we're putting people on the first footing of, this is a journey for you, uh, and we're going to help you try and achieve a drug-free lifestyle. But if I can jump in really quickly on that, like, if we're working with a, a cohort that uses drugs, what do you expect? Mm. They're going to get a negative urinalysis. So again, it's changed that perception. Um, what I said earlier, if the officer already has that perception that, oh, you're a drug user, we've caught you, mm -hmm. now you're going to be punished. Yeah. That's different to the perception of, oh, you made a mistake, how do we get you back on track? Mm -hmm. I think it's exactly right. And that is a very big challenge, and that's a very big challenge here. But it was in the UK when we rolled out um, the use of um, methadone and so on in the UK, it was much the same. Uh, that staff really struggled. Uh, it was IDTS at the time, Integrated Drug Treatment Program. Um, they really struggled with that. So, so Sarah, thinking about your experience over the last um, couple of years, what, what do you think are some of the initiatives that we have been successful in trying to embed? I think there's two standout initiatives for me. One would be the red dot policy. Um, so we have a policy in partly that if an inmate has got a history of or displays aggressive tendencies within the centre towards a member of staff um, or in any setting, what we would do is we would recommend them to go on to the, the red dot scheme which um, sees the red dot placed against their name. Obviously, the inmates don't know that they're on the red dot scheme, but it's it's a, a way of staff being aware um, that an, a, an inmate has displayed violent tendencies. So to just take extra care and to make sure that they've got sufficient staff and colleagues with them when they, uh, when they deal and liaise with this inmate. Um, the other programme would be the blue dot scheme as well, which we uh, introduced as part of our um, safer custody strategy. So again, if you've got an inmate who's being transferred in from a different um, centre with um, sufficient evidence that he's attempted suicide or self-harm in a previous custodial setting, or indeed um, states that they are um, contemplating self-harm here in Part Lee, we will place them on the Blue Dot programme, which is really just a way of um, custodial staff within the residential areas just taking an extra um, I taking you know, just a little bit extra care and, and also doing an extra case note just to make sure that the inmate is doing okay um, with the time in, in custody. And then for any further interventions, Ferry and his team will, will work with those particular inmates and then we could also call upon um, St Vincent's, our health provider for psychiatric support if required. 
So that scheme in itself has um, actually seen levels of um, self-harm reduce at partly by 40% over 12 months. So I think there's still things that we can do and we should be doing as part of our safer custody strategy um, to review the programme. Um, obviously, uh, we've also got to consider Aboriginal deaths in custody, which is, is a risk factor to us. It's a risk factor to um, custodial settings across the state. Um, so again, this would be something that we can look at as part of our um, Aboriginal strategy going forwards. And some of the inmates at the committee last week had got some ideas about how that could work as well in practice. So I think those would be two um, standout things really that we've, we've done and run successfully here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll echo the things that Ms. Sarah mentioned, but I think um, one thing that's yet to be implemented is the gold silver grunt scheme. And I'm really looking forward to that because before I started, I started in November of 2021, uh, and I was told about this scheme. And, and I think it allows um, inmates to have an idea of where they, they are in, in the system, but also gives them an incentive to not only continue to progress, but there is a, a, a possibility that they could regress within the scheme, um, which again takes away some of their um, uh, incentives. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'm really looking forward to, to having that in place at some point. Yeah, I would. So, the Gold Silver Bronze Scheme, um, people in the UK will know it as the IEP scheme, Incentives and then Privileges, and it came in after uh, the Manchester riots uh, in the 90s and other riots. Um, and it was really a way in which it was saying that uh, we know that the um, most effective way of managing and changing people's behaviour is actually to reward people, not just punish them. If punishment worked, all the prisons would be closed. Um, so clearly that doesn't work uh, you know, by itself. I was very surprised to arrive here and when I looked at the number of charges that could be laid against an inmate, the breaches of prison discipline, uh, it was over 60. Uh, the UK, I think it was 25 by the time I'd left. Um, so it seemed to be uh, very much an approach of, if you do this wrong, this will be the consequence. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's fine to have a consequence for negative behaviour. But there was little reward, it felt, for positive behaviour. And so if you behave, then what? Um, and why I think this is of fundamental importance is it feeds into the desistance theory of how and why people change. And one of these is that you develop a sense of personal agency. You feel you have some control over your destiny. So if you have a, an environment in which, no matter what you do, every time you do something wrong, you're going to lose something, you quickly find a prison, in my view, where you have nothing to lose. And that's incredibly dangerous. So we rebranded here the Incentives and Privileges Scheme, the Gold Civil Bronze Scheme. And for a period, we were able to run it uh, relatively, relatively successfully. Um, and we have a gold pod. Uh, and inmates in there have a number of privileges uh, that other inmates don't have. For example, they have vending machines that they can access and so on. And what that started to do was to say to prisoners, if you do something wrong, you may end up on bronze, uh, which we within the UK have called it basic, but there are lots of positive things for you to aspire to. And this is now up to you. You can be positive and you can engage and you can go to the gold pod. So instead of me saying, if you do this, then that, and I'm going to control your destiny, it's now up to prisoners to say, actually, I'm in control of my destiny, which is, again, one of the things we know that supports desistance. So you're right, you know, gold, silver, bronze, when we tried to manage through COVID, was very difficult to manage. And to be honest, it was impossible. But now we're in an environment where that's starting to pick up again. And you can hear inmates talking about wanting to be a gold level inmate. And one of the big advantages of gold level inmates, and the first thing I learned in Australia, is that people will do anything for a barbecue. Mm -hmm. So if we promise them a barbecue once a month, the staff, prisoners, it's just a very big thing where it's, it's understanding what really makes people tick. And that's a very simple thing. Suddenly they're going, oh, so I can have a barbecue. And having a barbecue actually makes you feel normal for an hour while you're just out there with your mates having a burger. So this is some powerful stuff that we hope to unpack uh, and restart. Um, I'm conscious of time now, so um, I'm, I'm going to start thinking again about now about you know the future uh, and uh, initiatives that we would hope to see rolled out. And really, some of these are in response to the challenges that, that we face. So, Sarah, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the buddy scheme 
And that this is a staff initiative and what we hope to do uh, by rolling out that scheme. Mm, yeah, sure. So uh, one thing that we're in the process of rolling out for this current, we've, we've currently got a uh, cohort of trainees in the final couple of weeks now of training. So I think that you can provide um, new trainees with a whole range of um, policy. You can sit them down for a period of time over in a classroom, but actually nothing beats getting onto the floor for the first time and having that experience of working as a custodial officer. I think when you, you feel that the eyes of the inmates are, are upon you, and watching every move, and they might not be, but I think that's how, how you perceive it to be. So one thing that we've introduced uh, for this current group of trainees is, is a buddy where the new officer has been matched up with a more experienced officer who will provide that level of coaching and mentoring for them when they, they start in their first few weeks of, of a new job, which is incredibly tough and a scary time. And I think nothing really prepares you for that, that first time when you, you're walking in. Um, having graduated from your course. So we feel that that will be a, a useful programme to help instill confidence um, in some of the new staff that we have. Yeah, I mean, it's worth reflecting on the fact that, you know, not only do we have um, prisons here for an incredibly short period of time, 35, 42 days, but that actually uh, around 50% of all of the officers here have two years experience or less. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk a bit about what we're doing now around Jailcraft, but Barry, I wondered if you could talk um, about the listener scheme because the listener scheme is well established in the UK and it's something we've tried to get off the ground here now so just the next steps for the listener scheme and what it is. Yeah I think um, from the psychology team perspective uh, the more staff the more we can get to the, um, the areas to the inmates to provide the support they need um, but we're not made of money and we can't have an unlimited amount of resources in, in psychology so the next best thing is probably to get um, the, the peer listening scheme program happening. Um, and that's about um, providing some training um, around um, how to interact. Uh, it's, 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 it's inmate uh, focused. So we recruit inmates to be peer listeners. And what they do is they act as uh, the eyes and ears uh, of the, the whole jail, but also for the psychology team to find out whether uh, people are coping within the, the jail environment, um, and part of the listener scheme is to give them some training, so give them to understand um, the mentality involved within uh, the, the jail setting, uh, some of the, the positive things that happen, but also some of the negative things and, and how we can actually manage that risk a little bit. So um, I think that's really exciting because that's a very inmate-driven initiative and it allows them to not only feel a sense of purpose, um, to provide something to uh, their peers and, and the community, um, but it also gives them some training in, in being able to deal with this as well. And that's we need all hands on deck in this particular situation. So while we've got staff, officers that, that are able to support inmates, if we have inmates supporting inmates, there's, there's a bigger, there's, there's more power involved in that. So that's, that's going to be really exciting. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I do look forward to that. I think it's essential here in the Remarm prison, a very high risk of self-harm, suicide, uh, etc. So I look forward to that. I think I would um, highlight what we intend to do over the next um, few months around delivering jail craft training uh, and alongside that five minute intervention training. So the staff um, by their very nature with the turnover that we've had are relatively inexperienced. The term we use in the UK is always jail craft, which was do you really understand what it means to be a good correctional officer? Can you put yourself in the inmate's shoes and think actually why is it so important that we get this thing fixed and that we do this thing? So it's really trying to teach them what I would see as the golden rules of being a good corrections officer, one of which, for example, is if you say you're going to do something, you must do it. Don't fob off inmates uh, and so on, um, because that builds a sense of trust. And if you have a sense of trust from inmates that you do what you say, it just makes the jail a whole lot safer because they will tell you things. That's what makes prison safer when you have that positive uh, type of relationship. And the other thing, that very you'll know this, is uh, I'm now also looking at how we um, roll out a variation of what was called the five-minute intervention in the UK, which really is good old-fashioned jail growth. And it's saying in five minutes, when you're having a conversation with a prisoner, you can ask some open-ended questions that starts to guide them to their own solutions. So again, instead of spoon-feeding a prisoner, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, Asking questions like, what do you think we might need to do to resolve this? And helping guide them, again, develops a sense of personal 
agency, and actually I'm in control of my destiny, aren't I? And with the support of staff, I can actually get to a place where when I get out, I'm just much less likely to win a film. And that to me is the magic bullet where I would like the whole prison to get that sort of rhythm and this is how we engage with prisoners. Because in a remand prison, we cannot fundamentally reduce reoffending by delivering lots and lots of programmes. The prisoners simply aren't here and we can't do offence-specific work. So I think that's the next, um, the, the next few months has to be focusing in on that, developing you know, the relationships with prisoners through listeners, developing relationships with our staff giving them the skills and helping them feel supported. Because for me, it's staff first. If you get the staffing right and you get the right staff doing the right thing in the right way at the right time, you will have a successful prison. And that's the big challenge for us at the moment. Um, okay, I'm just going to ask for any closing thoughts then from either you, Sarah, or, or Ferry, really on um, where you think we are in our journey uh, and what you think the most important next steps are for us to take, I think, to really try and solidify the progress that we have made, Sarah? Yeah, so obviously um, we uh, we were successful, MTC Broad Spectrum was successful at, at the bid um, when we, um, we took over from a different company. So I think really we're still, it feels in some way, we're still as part of the transformation journey. So uh, those of us who've been involved in bidding before, we know that the phrase is uh, mobilisation, transition, transformation. So we are at the transformation point, I think. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a fast journey, nor should it be. I think particularly when you've um, also got staff who've worked for the previous provider, um, it's, it's for them to also look at a new way of working. And it's a journey that you have to go on together. So I think it's about us um, solidifying the really good work that we've done over the, the past couple of years and then developing a plan for everything that we want to do. So having a look at the, the plan for the next few years. So, Paul, you mentioned earlier the fact that we also have a minimum security centre as well, which sets, sits separately from the main centre. It's what we're we doing for those inmates who are very different groups. So that's something that we're looking at. Um, for how we can, uh, we want to really be the, the leading light in, in minimum security management um, around programmes, around interventions, around making sure that the inmates move um, successfully back in, out into the community and um, get a job. You know, for some of them, they actually don't feel they're capable of getting a job because of their offending background. So it's how do we challenge that? So I think it's about having clear plans um, to go forward for each area of the centre and work together as an SMT and then work together at different levels across the centre then to deliver those plans. Okay. I think what I've... We spoke about Bionic, believe it or not, I care. And I think um, what I've seen um, from some staff is that they kind of treat it a little bit like a joke. They, they mention it jokingly uh, and in passing, but the funny thing is they actually um, display it. So even though they talk about it maybe... Um, like to, to have a little bit of joke around the, the whole I'm bionic kind of thing, they actually still do live that and, and still display that with, with the group they work with. So I think that's really positive. Um, my experience in the state-run jail was very different. Um, not everyone and a very small percentage of the group that I worked with um, had that idea of uh, care and, and um, driving safety, security, uh, decency. Um, so I think I've seen a lot more of that within our centre, which, which is really positive. And it's those people that we can then use to influence the others um, to, to, to come along. So I think um, in my experience, when you're working with people, especially with behaviour change, you've got that small percentage um, that don't want to change and they're really difficult to work with. You've got that other side, the, the percentage that are, are really are really bought in and really want to make that change. And you've got that group in the middle that's kind of on the fence. And what we need to maybe focus on is the, that group that we have that uh, uh, bought in and really want to change and see how they can influence those people in the middle. Um, not to say that the people at the other end of the spectrum are a waste of time. I think we can still try to in, in, improve that relationship and get them on board. But we've got a huge cohort of people that uh, are ready to, to buy into the, the, the idea of Bionic. And even though people use it jokingly, uh, there's a lot of people here that display it, which is really positive. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I mean, I, I, you know, first thing I did when I became governor was move my um, office right in the middle of the prison. Uh, and previously it was outside. And when I said, 
I'm going to move inside um, the staff, so that's a really good idea. Although they quickly realise that um, isn't always a good idea because I'm very visible and I see what goes on. But I think the most heartening thing for me that I started to see um, within a few months was staff being willing to engage in the right way with prisoners, talk to them, listen to them, um, treat them as people because they are. Uh, and then what we saw over a period of time sitting in that first year of operation was that the jail became safer. And I think uh, that again becomes self-fulfilling prophecy and it reinforces what we've been saying because quite frankly if a prisoner trusts you respects you uh, if things go wrong they are just less likely to hit you uh, and that's a fundamental principle is one of the first things that we said i'd say the challenge has been really in the last 18 months has been managing this through covid and that covid with many restrictions uh, many lockdowns uh, has meant that i would say we're probably 80 percent towards having the sort of prison that I think this can be. So uh, we're a long way there. Um, we've done some very good stuff. And there are some other things now that we need to embed in the next 12 months. You know, and that's our challenge. But I would say, you know, I, I have a senior management team around me that I have absolute confidence in. Uh, and know that this jail will be one that um, well, I'm already proud of. Uh, and that everyone who works here should be proud of. So um, I'll end there, just saying uh, thank you to both. Um, I'll check the camera now, make sure it was recording. <laughs> Otherwise we'll have to do it all again. Thanks all. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.